here and now. Here we are with Steve Struggle, myself, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld. And we each have uh, reports to be making here on this uh, week's uh, events. And we are in a continuing revolutionary struggle. This is not ending. This is accelerating. And we can hear now what uh, reports that we have to confirm this. Well, uh, well, uh, thank you, everyone, for another edition of the show. To join. I'm happy to join you today. Uh, I want everybody to just to know that uh, the uh, Israeli occupation forces, their army entered the Al Jazeera office of uh, in Nablus in the West Bank earlier today or yesterday. They entered the entered the office. They made they kicked everybody out the office and closed for forty five days. It's amazing. Mm. Forty five day closure. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'll tell so what tell I, I think that, that we need to know this is just like this is how they they tend to do this. They'll shut down the media and. Um, say that the media is either sharing state secrets or engaging pro Hamas propaganda. It's mm -hmm. kind of a it's a very sordid affair, actually. When this happens, um, here's another image of us here. This is from from Telegram. You can kind of see the different images. Here's soldiers entering the Entering the building, different images of soldiers here. This is this is Al Jazeera. Actually, these are it, these are its its own images, and these images come from Intel Republic, a site I, I monitor on Telegram. Um, <laughs> Outside, yeah. 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 Are you sharing screen? Yes. Okay, we don't see the image. We don't see your share screen. So let's let's see what's going on there. Let's 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 fix that. Thank you for letting me know. Let's go back. We are here. We'll go here. We'll try it again. Okay. Okay. So now we can see the different images of the raid. This is inside the Al Jazeera office yesterday in Nablus. <laughs> That's one set of images from the raid here. Here's another, some pictures, just still images. The soldiers fully in full gear. Wow. Masks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. The mask on. The gentleman on the right is from Al, Al Jazeera, I assume. He's, yeah. he's not in a military garb. Um, he's also yeah. just from Al Jazeera. This yeah, is coming from the He's calling a lawyer. Yeah. Okay, that's all. 
this image from outside. Hold on, hold on, for it. You're gonna be awkward, is that? I can't look for it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They just have to do that journalist. Hold on, hold on, for it. So those are, those are the three images that I have from um huh. from Telegram, which show the soldier inside the office of Al Jazeera. And they closed it down for 45 days. Wow. For a month and a half, which is a pretty long time. Telegram is seemingly very important. I've just yeah. uh, sort of hooked into that, you know, like uh, X uh, Twitter is, uh, you know, just shutting down uh, Russia today. And uh, he's, uh, Musk is proud of wow. it. <laughs> and he's uh, extolling it as a freedom, oh, yeah. freedom of expression. Wow. They're worried that any sort of, you know, thing can tip the election one way or the other, you know. So <laughs> what an election this is, you know, like this is uh, uh, certainly exposes the the failure of liberal electoralism to actually represent people. You know, what they call democracy is uh, a strange uh, you know, form of a Disneyland contest. Yeah. It, it's no sham. It's there's no way that. Well, I'm, a few months ago, a person I know was saying to me, "You know, this doesn't even seem like an election year," and they were right. It's just there's something very strange about this election. It's like some. It's like everything's been done behind the scenes or, or 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 in a corner, and the facade of the election is going on, but nobody's really thinking it's election year. Yeah, it's like okay. It's like in two weeks, in four weeks. Oh yeah, wow! I know I did. <laughs> but they're not even debating any issues. You know, there's nothing to talk about. That's <laughs> nothing to talk about. Yeah, all they do is right. trade insults. That's it. You know, and... <laughs> that's about it. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, do, I do my, I do send solidarity out to all the workers at at Al Jazeera. I hope, I hope no one was was you know uh, brutalized. Yeah. By, the, the, by the Israeli soldiers, hope they're able to get, able to get out of there. Yeah, and, right. and lawyers, maybe, maybe the lawyers can go to court and, and and get this thing overturned. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's totally little legal to begin with, you know, because that's in Sector A inside the you know city of Nablus, and uh, <clears throat> there should be uh, Palestinian police. It's during the day, you know, there should be Palestinian police there protecting Al Jazeera against the occupation, but where's the Palestinian police? Nowhere, nowhere, you know, not even during the daytime. At night, you know, they just, you know, like shut down completely. And they let the military take over and they just, the military comes in, roams the streets, you know, brings in, you know, some <clears throat> settler squatters, you know, to go and visit, you know, some tomb. And, uh, you know, there's no Palestinian police, you know, where to be found. They're even, being asked to supply 500 Palestinian police to help uh, suppress the uh, current intifada. I don't know if the PA has agreed to do so, but could be. It's incredible. Yeah. It uh, is. It is. Uh, I have a, a story to, sh to share as well, you know, which really impressed me. It comes from uh, England, uh, Electronic Intifada has featured the Palestine Action Group, a direct action group, which has carried out, you know, some 500 different actions already, you know, to shut down the war production facilities that are uh, <clears throat> supplying the Zionist regime with its uh, with its tools. And uh, the uh, company that they're focused on that they've had some success with is called Elbit. And they've carried out direct actions in, in uh, various, you know, factories throughout, you know, the... Uh, not so great Britain. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, right now, there's some 15 of their members that are in prison. And there's uh, a couple that are just, uh, I believe, got out of prison who are <clears throat> doing an interview now with uh, Ali Abunima. So I'd like to feature that and play that for you all. And uh, I think that that's, you know, like an incredible sort of kind of an action and a very, very advanced, very strategic, very effective. And... <clears throat> Uh, very repressed as well, so it needs our support. Here in Marial, yeah. there's a lot of military facilities producing stuff, you know, for American subsidiaries, you know, like General Dynamics, which is producing stuff that is being used in Gaza right now, but there's no campaign around it. 
nothing is being done, not even, you know, a simple protest, you know, at the gate. This reminds me of the Lytton campaign in Toronto in the 70s, when there was this factory there that was making the guidance system for the U.S. cruise missile, which came to be tested out in Western Canada <clears throat> late in 1983. And then we found it a peace camp on Parliament Hill in front of the government, which lasted more than two years. And finally, we won and they stopped the uh, cruise missile testing in Western Canada. But we had to <clears throat> set up a peace camp there and lived out there in the wintertime even, you know, for more than two years. Right. So that's what right. it takes. Okay, here. Yeah, I'll share the... Uh, yeah, I'll share this... Uh, you can actually see it on the UK activists. <clears throat> oh my <clears throat> I'm sorry I don't have it set up properly just a moment sure thank you no problem no worries so here's the interview with the Palestine Action Group in the United Kingdom that I've mentioned and uh this is very important, and this is uh, an example for the whole world, actually. Today, we'll, we'll be talking to returning guests Huda Amori and Max Geller from the Direct Action Group, Palestine Action. Uh, they are continuing their campaigns against Elbit Systems, the largest private Israeli arms manufacturer, which has factories and facilities across the UK uh, actually, in many countries, but we'll be talking about the UK, including sites that design uh, and are involved in manufacturing deadly drones that are being used in the genocide in Gaza right now, like Elbit's Hermes 450 drone. Um, there, uh, as well as, as murdering Palestinians on October 7th, these drones, it should be noted, have even been used to bomb many Israelis who were captured by Palestinian fighters. And that's an important detail often forgotten amid all the false claims about Palestinian atrocities that day. Now, there's been a long and uh, storied history uh, in the UK of nonviolent resistance to the arms trade. But Palestine Action has really been the first group to campaign uh, against uh, a company like Elbit in a sustained campaign of direct action over many years. And it's been able to do so because of growing support it's received, including from local community, communities, which often had no idea of the presence of, say, an Israeli drones park factory in their neighborhood. It's also significant that on several occasions, British juries have refused to convict Palestine action members for damaging property, um, and they've accepted the arguments that such actions are legally justifiable because they aim to prevent far greater harm in the form of Israel's war crimes and genocide. Uh, Palestine action has seen significant victories, and last time Huda was on the live stream, which was in March, she told us that Palestine action had managed to shut down two uh, L-beat facilities in the UK, its factory in Oldham, and its headquarters in London. And they also pressured four other companies which were providing services to Elbit to withdraw those services. So it's uh, no doubt due to their persistence and effectiveness that Palestine Action is a primary target of the British government's growing repression of the Palestine Solidarity Movement and right now, several of their activists are currently being held as political prisoners in British jails, uh, including co-founder uh, Richard Barnard, who is facing so-called terrorism charges. And many other activists have had their homes ransacked by uh, police. Um, so let's go to Huda and Max and welcome them back to the program. Hi, Huda and Max. So good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Okay. Uh, we're going to try and do this. We're going to hope that the sound is okay. Uh, if not, we're going to we're going to uh, do our best to adapt. But 
let's get right uh, into it, Huda. We're, we'll talk more about the repression that you're facing, but first update us on how the campaign is going. Uh, what are the significant developments or victories you've seen since you last spoke to us in March? Yeah, so last time we shut down two uh, Albert facilities in this country, and recently we permanently closed down another one of Albert weapons factories in Staffordshire. It was a factory that produced the parts for Israeli tanks. And after sustained direct action against the site, the profits had reduced by 75% because of their increased security costs. And uh, eventually they had to sell the site to a new company who have uh, distanced themselves from doing anything to do with the military um, or anything to do with Israel and Elbit. And now the factory is making parts for public transport. So quite a transformation for making parts for Israeli tanks to parts for public transport. We've also had other companies since cut ties with Elbit Systems and major divestments uh, from, from places like Scotia Bank, who have more than halved their investment in Elbit Systems, who are the largest foreign shareholder in the company. So we continue to see uh, huge victories, but also, also every single action we have is a victory against Albert Systems. Every time we manage to shut them down, break into their facility, expose vulnerabilities, and we're able to stop them being able to manufacture these weapons which they market as battle tested on the Palestinian people. And those actions have not stopped. If anything, they have intensified. Can you uh, give us an update on uh, Richard Barnard's um, hearing that, that Ali mentioned happened uh, earlier today? Um, tell us what what he's facing and, and what happened at the hearing. Yeah, so just to clarify, Richard isn't in prison. He's released on bail. And uh, today he had a his first hearing for new charges. These are three different charges for two speeches that he made in October last year. One count of Section 12, 1A, under the Terrorism Act, which is inviting support for a prescribed organization, Hamas, and two counts for encouraging criminal damage, as they say, against uh, Israeli weapons factories under Section 44 of the Serious Crime Act. What's interesting about this is that the, um, or disturbing, I should say, is that the Section 44 offences, we were both charged with that, and we went to trial at the end of last year, and they said, because we encourage direct action against Albert Systems, that we should go to trial on those charges, we defeated those charges. We were unanimous acquitted by a jury, and now they are retrialing him on exactly the same charge for calling for direct action once again. So it's very vindictive, but this time they're adding the um, the, the terrorism element in a bid to really try and to try and persecute rich, but by doing so, to send a message to the movement to try and intimidate us into stopping um, our movement, which is not going to not going to work. But he has now referred to the Old Bailey, uh, the Central Criminal Court in London, and so he'll have another hearing on October fourth. That, uh, and Huda, just I, I do apologize about that error, and I'm glad to hear that Richard is not in, in jail. And just to clarify, are there members of the group who are currently in detention? Yes, so we currently have 16 political prisoners right now, 10 of whom were detained under the Terrorism Act. They were actually held in military confinement for a week, uh, interrogated repeatedly, not given adequate amounts of food before they were charged with not terror offences and remanded to prison. So remand means being held in prison before trial. That happened after six of them had broken into Albert's new research facility in Bilton, Bristol. And this facility was obviously very precious to Albert, but five million pounds building it, and activists had managed to break inside despite um, despite it's supposed to be supposedly being highly, highly secured. And when they were inside the facility, they destroyed, um, this is on video, Israeli quadcopter drones. Uh, the ones, the same model of drones were seen used in Gaza 
the same model of drones that we've seen mimic the sounds of women and children crying to the lure Palestinians and kill them. Those were inside that site and they managed to destroy them. And in a bid to punish them and deter them, they held them under the terrorism act, abusing counter-terrorism powers. We have another one, Francesca, who published a letter on, on electronic intifada. He's being held as well in Wakefield, who took action against Barclays and also against an American reference factory. And we also have five who've been sentenced in Scotland um, for taking action against a weapons factory in Glasgow. That that uh, you know that that is of course uh, people putting themselves at a great personal risk to do this work. Max, um, we've just heard from Hoda that uh, she and Richard were acquitted by a jury uh, on very serious charges. Of course, that doesn't mean that the British state is going to give up, uh, and just. Uh, a couple of days ago, Palestine Action announced that a jury, another jury, refused to convict four actionists who cost Teledyne's weapons factory over 500,000 pounds in damages. That's uh, probably, I think, around $750,000 by disrupting the production of Israeli missile parts. And this acquittal, acquittal came even though the judge had, had sharply restricted the uh, defenses that the, the uh, accused individuals were allowed to make, and yet the jury still refused to uh, convict them. But I understand they are going to be retried because it was a, a hung jury. The question I, I, I want to ask you, Max, to comment on that, why you think juries are doing this, and Talk about, you know, you've been an activist in the Palestine Solidarity Movement for many years in both the US and now the UK. Why did you choose Palestine, Palestine Action uh, and to get involved in this kind of work when you moved to the UK, knowing the kind of risks that are involved? And what's the significance of uh, how quickly it appears to have won victories that have eluded other kinds of uh, movements uh, who've been working for an arms embargo or a, a, an end to the arms trade for years? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question. And it, the news that you're you're referring to, at the Teledyne action that um, the British state failed to convict on, this is an excellent news story. This is really a beautiful story that we can all celebrate together. Um, they had these four activists, you know, the, the government felt like they had them dead to rights. There was no defenses available to them. The uh, destruction of this weapons factory was on video. And yet, during a genocide, a British jury of these four actionist peers refused to convict them. And I think this is... Um, this is the silent majority speaking here. Um, after a, a full year of ineffective marching, um, marches that don't yield the results that we've all been, you know, desperate for, um, it's nice to see uh, true democracy in action. Uh, even though the British state won't listen to its people, uh, the judge had no choice but to listen to this jury and set those four actionists free. Um, it's uh, it's also, I think, uh, indicative of why you see the state coming up with these new types of, of charges for Palestine actionists. Uh, if juries will not convict, they have to come up with a way of detaining indefinitely without charge. And um, the Terrorism Act uh, provides that. It is one of the most draconian and fascist uh, legal apparatuses available to the state. Um, these victories that uh, Hoda uh, is discussing um, are coming, you know, uh, in spite of an extremely repressive new British government. Uh, the speech Richard Barnard gave was back in October when there was a different uh, administration in power. 
that administration, a Tory administration, a conservative government, refused to charge Richard. And uh, but uh, this liberal uh, new government had no problem using the Terrorism Act to try and shut down Palestine action. It just goes to show, I think, how effective we are, because if we weren't effective, they wouldn't be trying to throw uh, terrorism charges at us. Uh, it's um, in the same way that I don't think uh, YouTube would be censoring uh, your live stream if it weren't such an important platform. I think all of these uh, things are, are, are extremely uh, related and it feels extremely empowering to be part of an organization um, that has, uh, that is willing to put, um, to do what's necessary during a genocide to stop it. I mean, the 16 people who are in jail are truly some of the most noble, beautiful souls I've ever met. And I, I, I know a bunch of them, you know, like it's a, I've never had this experience, you know, in my years of, of activism where so many of my friends are in jail right now. It's, um, it's part of the reality that we're all living in. And, and these people are just like me. They're just like, you know, I, I, they're, uh, they're from similar backgrounds and, and, uh, and they're, they're like determined to stop this genocide with their own hands. And I can just say that like at, at, at these trials, the response from the public has, is really uh, wonderful and scary to the British authorities because at today's hearing, there is over a hundred people outside and um I get, uh, you know, I'm one of the people who's on the support, uh, the prisoner support teams, and we're getting letters from inspired people all around the world. All around the world, people are paying attention to how the British government are treating our brave actionists, and they're saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This isn't consistent with what's going on. There's something, uh, there's something really the matter here. And I, I think it's clarifying for people. Um, and, and Max, what are you calling on people to do in support of these political prisoners? What are the kinds of things people watching today can do to support them? It's a great question. As of right now, we have two uh, of our actionists who are being held um, in violation of their rights without phone and without communication from the outside world. Every single one of their letters has been censored and withheld from them so far. And we're talking about dozens a day. Um, they're all across the UK. People are sending in postcards to these actionists. And um, I think they're up on the screen now. And the uh, prison uh, warden has refused to deliver their mail. So we and have- And names there, just sorry, just uh, on the screen, uh, William Plasto and Ian Sanders, for those who are listening to the broadcast and not seeing it. Sorry, Max. Um, no, not at all. Um, and so we have started a letter writing campaign to the warden demanding that uh, she uh, give William and Ian their mail as consistent with British law. They've also been denied phone calls for no reason. It's um, it's just another way of punishing um, Palestinian activists uh, for the crime of being in solidarity uh, and against uh, the British state. Mm. Well, in the past uh, few months, we've seen, of course, a huge uptick in global uh, campaigns of repression by the Western states, uh, primarily targeting the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Um, we talked on the stream a couple weeks ago about uh, activist and social media user Sarah Wilkinson uh, and how her home was raided by UK, quote, anti-terror police. Um, Ali has been banned by Germany in an attempt to stop him from speaking about the genocide. Um, what do you think accounts for this upsurge in repression right now? As you know, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the, the public, uh, you know, has overwhelmingly been in support of Palestine actionists. Um, and, and yet, you know, Keir Starmer's government is, uh, is, is trying to just throw the entire book at them. Um, a question for you both, but uh, let's start with Max. Uh, the, 
the victories that we're getting are not victories that have been um, normally associated with the solidarity movement. Um, victories, and, and it's not just here in the UK. People who use direct action uh, tactics against uh, Israeli targets win. Uh, we had an amazing victory of a, uh, an Israeli weapons uh, facility in Cambridge, Massachusetts, being forced to, to um, uh, shutter its, uh, its doors uh, two weeks ago. These, and this followed a sustained direct action campaign. Uh, these, this type of repeated action and showing up over and over and over again is, um, you know, has always been a blueprint for victory. And these types of victories, which go again, you know, which fly in the face of um, U.S. imperialism are really scary to uh, the U.S. state and its clients. Yeah. Hoda, um, what are your thoughts on that? I think Elvis days are numbered in this country, and they know that. When you can't secure your facilities, when people continue to occupy, break in, and destroy your weaponry, there's only so much you can take. We've seen them, they've been forced to sell and shut down several factories already. And I think they are on the edge of leaving this country for good. And I think the state is responding to try and protect them. And when you've all been proven people, and that hasn't worked, when you take people to court and remove their rights to lawful defenses, to argue their crime so fully, to uphold international law, to prevent the greater crime, and that doesn't work to stop people, then terrorism really is the end of the road in terms of tactics that the state can try and use to try and deter people from taking this type of action. So I think actually they've just shown that we are closer than before to victory, to getting rid of Albert systems in this country, um, and they're desperate to stop us. We know that Elbert have complained about the detrimental impacts we are having to their business, and they're showing that through these uh, prosecutions. And I forgot to mention before, but today at Richard's meeting, it was confirmed that Labour's Attorney General was the one, as Max said, it's Labour's government who authorised these charges. We haven't seen people be detained under the Terrorism Act um, until Labour came into power. And we haven't seen these type of charges we brought against people until Labour's Attorney General consented to Richard being charged under the Terrorism Act. So this, this government is desperate to protect Albert systems. But at this point, we're at a unique time in history where they are going to do everything to try and stop us. They will put more people in prison. But when you continue at this point, and when you continue to grow, which we are as a movement, that's when Albert realized that they have to leave this country. Nothing is going to stop us. But uh, you, uh, before you co-founded Palestine Action, you were a campaigns officer at the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, which is a well-known organization in the UK. It organizes large marches. Uh, you worked on different kinds of campaigning methods, such as lobbying politicians and institutions. And of course, those are things that people still do and that are in themselves valuable. But what lessons have you learned after being involved in a variety of tactics over the years? And can, can you talk about where you see different tactics fitting into this movement at this time? Yeah, so my, my experience at PSC really um, was the major, major part of my campaigning life that spurred me on to taking direct action and to starting Palestine Action with other like-minded people. And I think you get to a point when you realize you're trying the same tactics over and over again. And despite the limitations of what you're doing, you're told to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And there's a lot of respectability politics um, to play as well when it comes to these politics. And, you know, you, you're banding yourself against a brick wall constantly and not getting results or not getting results that match the severity of what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people. And I think it was really those limitations that are set by these kind of bigger organisations that led me to take that action against uh, Israel's weapons trade. I was just sick and tired of, you know, I've done lots of research against institutions, their investments in these companies, pointing out the hypocrisy against their own ethical investment policies, um, lobbying politicians, armed cargo campaigns to stop arming Israel. 
and you're constantly getting the same the same feedback, the, the same the same lack of interest or deliberate lack of interest because there is a heavy Israel lobby at play. I'm told to do the same thing. And I just believe that when we have Israeli weapons factory operating in our doorstep, and rather than beg someone to stop killing our brothers and sisters in Palestine, I can just go up there, like many people have done in Palestine action, and just go shut them down ourselves. And we have done that. And to be honest, it's the most, uh, it's, it's strange to say, but it's liberating. And it's very empowering when you let go of those constraints. You know, we're often told, just ask nicely, you know, be respectable to the politicians, and maybe they'll try and stop killing our brothers and sisters in Palestine. That has not worked. And actually, when you realize that you have power in yourself to go climb on a ladder or break into a factory and you can literally destroy the site and stop them from operating, then then that's what that's 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 what we need to go ahead and do. Uh, and and so I think direct action is uh, there is a place for everything in this movement, but direct action plays a significant part. And the whole movement needs to be supportive of each other. And that includes, you know, when we're facing repression like we're facing in Palestine action, what the state tries to do is isolate parts of the movement from other parts. They're trying to say, look, you know, we're using counterterrorism powers against people. We're testing the waters to see how the wider movement reacts. Stand in solidarity with one another and don't allow them to isolate certain parts of our movement. That's when the state fails. Um, and that when they back down as well, because they realize the amount of support that we have for each other within the within this movement. And there needs to be a lot more of that um, for the big organizations, towards groups like Palestine Action, especially at this point in time. Mm. I, can, I can just reflect listening to you, Huda. I remember the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, I don't like to think about 9-11 uh, very much, but uh, uh, after the September 11, 2001 attacks, there was a great deal of repression in the United States. And the Bush administration went, particularly after Palestinian Americans who had absolutely nothing to do with the September 11th attacks. But there was a wave of prosecutions, the Holy Land Five, there were other cases. Who are still in jail. Yeah. yeah who were still in prison for, yeah. for decades for raising money for charities that were also funded by the United States government in Palestine. And there was the case of Samuel Arian and the repression his family went through. There was the case of uh, the late Mohammed Salah uh, and... Uh, uh, Neil uh, Right, and Abdul Halim Ashkar and other cases. And there are others I'm not uh, mentioning. But what I remember about that period was how much fear there was in the community um, and how much fear there was uh, even to come forward and support these people who were facing this repression. And the, the isolation that they felt was certainly, uh, certainly helped the government. And I'm not saying that that fear was unjustified. Um, you know, it was a real atmosphere of terror. I'm often shocked when I, I, well, I shouldn't be shocked. I hear a lot of Americans, what they call normies, say, oh, I wish we could go back to the spirit after 9-11 where everyone was united. No, it was a period of fear and terror for large communities in the United States. And what the point I want to get to is eventually that fear broke and people started to support each other. And that made an enormous difference in subsequent efforts by the government to isolate people, to subpoena them, uh, raiding homes and so on. People started to come out and support each other. And that defeated, in many cases, those government repression efforts. So just listening to you, I'm reflecting on that experience that we had in the United States after 9-11 and the importance of solidarity, the importance of people showing up when there are trials, showing up in court, showing up outside the court. I mean, you know, judges, of course, I'm not advocating that anyone uh, should unduly influence the judicial process, but judges are human, juries are human. When they see that there is broad support for someone who's being accused, it makes them think, 
Uh, hang on, what's going on here? This isn't just some sort of common criminal, but there's a bigger story here that that is driving a lot of people to care about what's going on here. And I've heard it uh, many times that that public support makes an enormous difference. So I'm hearing something similar from, from, from you, I think. Go ahead, yes. Max. Can I just say one thing? The, uh, the um, I was struck during Nora's, as I often am during Nora's news rundowns, of just how it, it, you know, if you try and make sense about a uh, a dad uh, finding his daughter uh, face down with her roller skate, nothing like that makes you can never make sense of anything. Uh, this horror, but um, you know, since Palestine action started, we've had over five hundred actions, five hundred different direct actions, and the. Um, it makes sense to people. It makes sense to people who are watching a genocide to um, take action, or take uh, take matters into their own hands. It it, it is something that um, allows us to process what we're seeing. We're seeing something so horrible. So I have to do something that I've never done before. And thousand, uh, you know, almost a thousand different people in in the UK have, have come to the same conclusion. And it's truly uh, inspirational to be a part of. We are um, doing something that no one has ever done before. The diversity of tactics that uh, we're de uh, deploying, wh whether you are a truck company, a computer company, a cleaning company, if you contract with Elbit, you can expect Palestine action. It has become extremely difficult for the Israeli war machine to do business in the UK. And this is a model that is repeatable everywhere. And everyone is getting the same images across their phones and their computer screens every morning. And the tactics that we have um, been de uh, deploying are, are working. And they uh, are not only working, but they are um, reasonable given what's happening right now. Yeah, I, I I think you said that so well. I mean, the, the 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 visceral, the physical reaction that many of us around the world have um, to seeing this genocide being live streamed, twenty four hours a day, um, for nearly twelve months now, a whole year, um, and and people people feel obligated. Uh, to, to do something about it, uh, especially when we see the, the people in power in the UK and here in the US, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to, to get us to replace action with just, you know, platitudes and words that resemble some sort of empathy while still handing over you know, these MK-48 whatever uh, bunker buster bombs that are obliterating children, sleeping families in their tents on the sea. I mean, it's just, it it it, it makes you feel like you're going crazy. Um, and so to be able to channel that into action, um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, obviously that's incredibly powerful for people. And for those who can't put their bodies on the line like that, um what are some ways what what are some other you know diversity of tactics uh, you mentioned what are some ways that people can be involved in uh groups like palestine action um without uh you know um smashing up weapons factories directly I'm, 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 I was going to say, although I, I, I'm not going to ask that question because we might get, uh, the program might get nuked. Go ahead and answer Nora's question. Nonviolent <laughs> 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 direct action, you know, that, 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 that route. Yeah. Uh, well, you do, let me put the question this way. <laughs> you do a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, which have been now habitually ruled by British courts to be entirely legal and justifiable. Uh, if people want to get involved in the whole range of things you do, 
including prisoner support, which we, and other forms of activity uh, could be helping to publicize the work you do, organize support for it, uh, educate people about the crimes Elbit is committing about uh, uh, against Palestinians in Gaza. How do they learn more about what you do? How do they get in touch? What are the ways that people can um, can yeah can get get involved through the whole diversity of ways that you work? So, one of them is showing up showing up with a child as you mentioned we're from all across the country so really like wherever you are there will be something coming up near you up to those court cases you can stand outside waving the flag or you can come inside the public gallery watch the court cases happening and um, you can join police station police station support so supporting activists once they get held in police stations and released we actually are going to hold um support workshops that people can join we also hold training days on direct action and online workshops. So visit our website. There's a workshops page where you can see the different types of ways that you can get involved. I say if you're not here, you know, for us with the political prisoners, especially and the attacks on our movement, one of the ways of speaking up about them, making it visible, making it known, and um, that these people are sacrificing their liberty right now for the Palestinian people um, and to make them visible. Because obviously one of the main tactics of the state is to isolate people, is to put them behind bars, is to withhold them from being able to um, have postcards and make phone calls. But we can defeat that by making their faces, their names um, and what they've done visible. And 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 uh, that's, that's a really crucial part of showing solidarity with the political prisoners both here in Britain and of course the prisoners in, in Palestine. That's, that's exactly it. And yeah, go ahead, Max. I would also just say that no matter where you are um, uh, watching this live stream or listening to it, um, you can, there is a uh, action you can take uh, locally against Elbit. No matter what, uh, even if your cause isn't Palestine, um, Elbit uh, is involved in repression around the world, um, from the U.S.-Mexico border to securing mines in the Congo to Azerbaijan and Armenia. These uh, Elbit drones uh, are sold to the world's most repressive, uh, repressive governments to, uh, and, and to assist in the most uh, extractivist uh, and awful activities uh, imaginable. So... Um, just, it, it's important to understand that uh, the, the role Elbit plays in a, uh, repression worldwide. I mean, uh, one of the things Ali led off by saying is, is, is how local communities respond. Um, the first uh, major victory Palestine action had was in a, in a uh, Kashmiri predominant area here in the UK. When the locals found out that Modi was buying Elbit drones to repress Kashmiris back home, they came out in force and it became not just a Palestinian issue, but a Kashmiri issue, a local issue. And that was instrumental in that victory. And that's a that's not uh, unique to any one community here in the UK. Um, I promise if you are uh, doing work locally, um, you are working with a community that's being affected by Elbit drones. Mm. Well, Huda and Max, it has been fantastic to hear everything that's going on. And you are clearly posing a serious um, a challenge to the British state uh, and its involvement in this genocide of the Palestinian people. And last week, of course, we had Matt Kennard on from Declassified UK who talked about how although Britain is a relatively small and significant country, it plays an outsized role in this genocide. And you are there challenging that role on the ground. So uh, we thank you for giving us all this information. And of course, we remind people that they can find out more at palestineaction.org or by following you on social media. And there's lots of ways they can get involved and we hope you'll come back again and give us another update soon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you both of you. Thanks for all you do.
Wonderful. Excellent. That's the the best uh, work that the electronic empire has, has done. You know, they've broken open a whole strategy of people who become involved with. And that's what you have to do. You have to get involved at a certain at the level that you're able to get involved and help build that struggle and show solidarity and build a movement against against the Zionist repression, against against the Israeli um murder machine. That's excellent. That's why what you do. Yes. And you have to produce results. You know, if you just offer people the opportunity to repeat, you know, what they've done before with no effect, well, they're not going to keep on doing that. You know, they have to give them some way in order to be effective. And this is the way, direct action. Yes. And exactly. it has worked in England, you know, but here in Montreal, you know, the movement hasn't even taken up that matter. And even though there's general dynamics and a lot of other American subsidiaries, you know, here are doing their, their work. I have uh, my case uh, myself coming up. Uh, I think it's January the 5th that it's uh, going to be sort of taking place. Um, I've already contacted uh, to be an expert witness. I've contacted um, uh, Professor Yakov Rapkin at the University of Montreal, and uh, he's going to be uh, uh, testifying uh, as an expert witness and on my behalf, you know, because we've worked, you know, since a long time in the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians, which um, then, uh, you know, expanded to become the Independent Jewish Voices, you know, which has been very effective as well in its work. And recently they secured the victory of the uh, Canada Revenue Agency, which has uh, unregistered the uh, Zionist uh, charitable organization called the Jewish National Fund, the one in the, that puts out the little blue boxes in all the school, uh, Jewish schools, you know, asking the students to put their their change into, you know, to be taken over uh, and uh, used to, to plant trees, supposedly, when in fact, you know, it's being used to take over Palestinian lands. Now they've been deregistered. <laughs> This is a great victory. Incredible, you know. And uh, I expect that our constitutional challenge on January the 5th will also be well received. And we need a lot of people coming there to uh, participate in the public gallery to show that there is support in addition to the expert witness of Yaakov Rapkin. And uh, then we can uh, establish that, you know, to uh, call out for um, a free Palestine and a free Palestine, exactly, precisely, is what I wrote on, you know, the, the Zionist uh, 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 announcement, you know, uh, uh, a fish, we call it in French, um, placard, uh, that was on a public, uh, you know, post, uh, a lamppost, you know, that I wrote on. And this is what's called criminal mischief. And it is a charge laid by the hate crimes division of the Montreal Police Force. Oh, well, they're going to have to answer for that in court. Okay. And so there, go. there we go. And I think that was a, an excellent 38 minutes, you know, of incredible testimony from these activists. Yeah. Very yeah. good. This will be well. Right. Thank okay. You. That's great for this week, you know, and uh, even though, you know, like the repression is continuing, as you uh, have uh, proven yourself, you know, in the Al Jazeera case, and uh, in the case of, you know, uh, Russia today being banned from uh, X now, <laughs> which is supporting Trump, you know, Trump Musk has come out, you know, like full blown, you know, like extolling him as some kind of an angel. This is what we're facing and the repression on top of it all, you know, plus, you know, no, you know, uh, um, no uh, possible alternative, you know, in, in terms of, you know, Democratic Party campaign, which offers no alternative whatsoever. So, no, no. yeah. So we've got, you know, Dr. Jill Stein, though, you know, making, a lot of noise and getting a lot of attention from the Muslim American community, which is supporting uh, Jill Stein in Michigan, you know, more so than the Democratic Party. So these are th the, both the repression and the advances being made by the United Front movement are incredible. And uh, the repression is only coming to bear because we are becoming effective. Right. Great to speak with you again this week. And until next week, we are the Here and Now Forum. And this is uh, Steve Struggle speaking there. And I am Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, thanking you for your attention, asking you to share once again. <laughs>